record on this computer. And usually it tells me it's doing it. Well, it doesn't want to. Okay. All it's right. So, record. Yeah, it does. Okay, good. I, well, okay. I pushed record. So, um, oh God, I don't want to edit. That was a nightmare. Oh yeah, it's there. Okay. It's there. It's right. got pause stop. It just used to be a red button last time. Anyway. All right. So we're going to begin with perspective illusion and diabolical science in the early Renaissance Florence with Professor Dennis Raverty, who is a art historian and teacher. And this is uh, the second in three series that we're doing with him. Welcome. Thank you for having me again. Yes, um, and uh, one of my great joys was a couple of years ago, I actually taught Renaissance, early Renaissance art in Florence. So that oh. we, uh, from my university, we went over and uh, every day was a field trip. It's a very walkable city. Um, and it's a city, it's an unusual city in, in many ways because it really is a Renaissance city. And you really realize if you go to nearby Siena or Pisa or other more medieval cities of how sort of almost modern uh, Florence uh, looks. Okay, so today, last week we looked at Giotto di Bondone uh, from the early uh, 1300s and we had talked about how uh, this late Gothic artist before the Renaissance is really kind of a proto-Renaissance artist. That is, he anticipates many of the developments in the Renaissance uh, all kind of by himself. So he's a, he's a one-man movement in some ways, or I shouldn't say that because he had a whole workshop uh, of assistants working with him. But in, in, and this is a detail from the death of St. Francis, uh, that uh, passion in the face of Brother Rufio, uh, who looks uh, at, the, uh, at the face of the uh, expired saint uh, longingly. They had met many years earlier in prison, and, uh, and, um, and, and so uh, Giotto uh, captures this human quality that we just don't see in medieval art. But we also noticed how, uh, at the same time, it opens up certain doors to think of depicting a three-dimensional space. It also creates certain problems, and we looked at this from his Arena Chapel last week of the Last Supper, and, uh, and notice how uh, it's interesting He's trying to bring us into a three-dimensional space, but doesn't quite know how to do it. These figures are, have a lot of gravitas. They have a lot of weight. Just look at those bottoms sitting there. You really feel that they're in you know, space. But he has problems here when he tries to create a room and feels in, you know, compelled to put a support in here, a very slender support, but he doesn't know what to do with it when he comes to the disciple. It sort of reemerges uh, later. So there are problems uh, in this uh, new three-dimensional world that he's dealing with. And I want to point out too how the halos, uh, which are tarnished because they're all going to abandon Jesus soon, uh, um, and uh, but they, so their halos are black and tarnished. But notice how their halos move with them as uh, this. Uh, if I get my arrow here, this guy turns toward Jesus. The the halo kind of goes with him. It's interesting that here, as I mentioned last week, it really doesn't work in the back figures because it looks like they're licking their plates, uh, you know. So uh, this is the kind of problem that didn't exist in earlier medieval art that was uh, openly two-dimensional. It was vehemently two-dimensional. And this is part of the ceiling mosaic in the baptistry in uh, Florence. And a lot of people overlook this magnificent ceiling because they're so enamored of the works of the early and the high renaissance that are everywhere that they kind of forget that this wonderful uh, medieval um, mosaic mostly designed by Copa di Marco Voldo. And here you can see um, uh, Christ is in this this huge uh, halo and and which doesn't represent the world but represents the universe which they considered was kind of an egg shaped or a, a sphere. Um, and, and so he kind of sits on the throne of the sky, but he doesn't have a lot of weight. He seems almost to float miraculously. And that's part of the beauty of these medieval images, especially with the gold flickering and the way the gold changes as you move, going from bright and shiny to dark. And so it has this uh, almost a quality with the, some of these mosaics of, uh, of uh, um, 
a mirage or something like that, like people beaming in. I remember on the old Star Trek, people would beam in, and it has kind of that quality. But I just want to take a detail here. You can see as these apostles, their halos are round, and it doesn't matter which way they turn. The angels kind of behind the apostles turn to the right and turn to the left. The, the halo remains a round, uh, flat thing because uh, he doesn't have the problem of what do you do once you're in a three-dimensional space. I just want to flash ahead a hundred years to another Last Supper, and this is by Girland Dion. This is also in Florence. This is in the former rectory of the um, of the uh, monastery of uh, what's it, San Marco Monastery, which is my favorite place in Florence, and a lot of people don't realize it's there. But Fra Angelico painted all these. Uh, Murals, and we'll look at that those later. But this is in the dining room by Ghirlandaio. And here you can see he solved all those problems of space, or most of them. He puts Judas on this side without a halo, but their little halos kind of sit like, like platters on their head. And I wanted to point out too how he blends in the actual architecture of the dining room with the imaginary space beyond it, creating a very kind of realistic three-dimensional space. Um, and this wonderful garden behind has allusions to the Medici family because the symbol of the Medici, the banking family that sort of de facto ruled Florence and um, uh, paid for, for example, this Nero uh, by Ghirlandaio, they, their symbol was oranges. Uh, and they have orange trees in the garden of the Medici Palazzo. And so here these oranges are a tribute to uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent, who, who um, who paid for this wonderful uh, mural from the dining room of the monastery. Uh, I want you to notice also the wonderful peacock that's uh, perched there. That's also a reference to the Medici because uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent had peacocks that came all the way from China, had a pair of them, and they'd strut around his garden as he'd have these little intellectual soirees. Uh, but if we go back to Giotto, once again, back to the 1300s, you can see the difference in the space. We have here, and we looked at this last week, also from that St. Francis cycle, where St. Francis is uh, taking off his clothes. There's a lot of scenes of nakedness with St. Francis, by the way, and that's not entirely incidental, because Francis began this idea that the human body is good. It's not just a place of sin. It's not just a, it's, the world is not just a veil of tears filled with temptation that you somehow have to make through. Uh, uh, and, and stay away from wine and stay away from sex and stay away from everything that's fun because this is a bad world. And Francis really had this, he did a wonderful sermon at one time, it said, uh, about nakedness and how uh, Adam was naked when he was created by God in the image of God and how uh, Moses was naked when he was uh, put into a basket and floated down the, uh, the river to be found uh, by the uh, daughter of the Pharaoh. Uh, and Christ was naked when he was born in the stable, and Jesus was naked when he, uh, when he was crucified and naked when he ascended into heaven. So nakedness is not something to be ashamed of. Nakedness uh, is, is something to be proud of. So this new humanism that, although it did not abandon the medieval idea of sin and all the temptation, uh, kind of spun the coin the other way and tended to look at the world as this magnificent sort of palace uh, that God and all things, all the you know the brother, son, and sister moon, and all these other uh, references to nature, that it's really a palace. It's a garden of Eden, even despite uh, pestilence and and uh, terror and and uh, murder and uh, sin and all those other bad things. But what I really want to point out here uh, is the architecture, because the architecture looks uh, like doll architecture. But especially if we look at these, um, this tower in the upper left of the composition, we can really see some of the challenges that Giotto ran into in trying to depict this three-dimensional space. Uh, and parts of it are convincing, but they don't fit together from one vantage point. For example, we're looking down on this roof, this tile roof, we're looking down on the roof. Uh, but we're looking up under here, and we're looking up under this, and we're looking up even down here. So we're both above and below it. Uh, and then he can't quite make these two things jive the way they should, and so he uses this kind of distortion 
and I really think it's in an attempt to render three-dimensional uh, architectural space convincingly, uh, and, and it's pretty good for eyeballing it, but he just didn't have a system uh, that would come with the Renaissance. I wanted to point out the steps because individual parts of it are kind of rational, but to look at the steps, he really has to kind of stretch them down in a strange sort of way. And I just can't help thinking two glasses of Chianti and you'd never make it down, you know, those steps. Uh, but, um, but anyway, Giotto, I didn't want to take away from Giotto or use him simply as um, the old fashioned style that didn't quite do it because that's not my opinion of this great artist. Giotto in a way has never been equaled or surpassed. Uh, but he does have this kind of shallow space. He creates a space, but it's a sh shallow space, like a stage set. And those little architecture, doll-like architecture in the background, look like also they could be stage sets. And remember, we were saying that it was during the 1300s that theater, which had been illegal since the Christians got in, in the early Middle Ages, was now revived, but doing biblical stories on the steps of the cathedral. Uh, as their kind of background. And so you'd have uh, the stories of David and, uh, or of, um, of Daniel, the play of Daniel. I know New York Pro Musica for many years did uh, performances of that medieval play of Daniel. And remember, most people couldn't read, so this was their way of, of accessing these Bible stories. But just to show you the shallow space of Giotto compared to the deep space of the Renaissance. And this is, I've jumped ahead to the you know, the second part of the century here, and this is Perugino's Christ giving the keys to St. Peter, but I don't want to dwell on the, um, on the subject matter so much. I want to really look at the architectural construction, because in the background, he's in a really deep space that goes to infinity in the background, and uh, these very Brunelleschian kind of looking uh, architectural fragments. This looks like um, <clears throat> the, the art of Constantine or of Titus in Rome. This looks very much like the Duomo in Florence by Brunelleschi, and, and, uh, and it recedes into uh, the past, into a deep uh, space. <clears throat> but it's also a measurable space because it's a mathematical system. There's no guesswork any longer in perspective. So this gigantic piazza, it's a gigantic piazza, it doesn't really exist anywhere but in the imagination of Perugino and then on the wall. But it is a three-dimensional measurable space. What do I mean by that? Well, <coughs> look at these big, I guess they're granite <coughs> blocks of stone <coughs> that uh, are pavement for this gigantic piazza. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, that each of those stones is 10 foot by 10 foot. They seem to be square. So if we want to judge the distance between Jesus's right foot and this figure in middle distance, his right foot, it's very easy to do. 10 feet to the first stone, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet. I'd say it's about 44 feet from Jesus. If those stones are, once you get one measurement, then you can reconstruct the whole thing. And we can actually do a map of this imaginary piazza and pinpoint where each tree was, where each architectural thing was, which each person was uh, positioned. And, um, and, and so it's a mathematical system. And it, it's a long ways from the flatter space of Giotto. I want to throw this one in too, and this is by Montaigne. I would just look uh, briefly at it. Here, the vanishing point is very low. Here, here, I forgot to say this. The horizon line is always at the eye level of the viewer. Um, so we're standing above Jesus and his disciples, maybe on some steps, maybe on a ladder, and we look straight across to the horizon here. Uh, here, there's no horizon. Here, by Montaigne, and this is St. James being led to execution, is the executioner here, uh, we're very, very low perspective, because if you connect all these orthogonal lines in the uh, Roman-looking arch, it ends up being below uh, the, the picture. And so Montaigne even teases us a little bit with his breathtaking realism by having the executioner's heel overlap the step, the top of the step. So it's like we're walking up some steps, but our head is still below his heel so that when he, he steps off that step, we see the bottom of his heel a little bit. Okay, so it's a very precise place 
in, in only one place. We don't flit around seeing it from above and the sides and everything like we find in Giotto's um, much less convincing uh, space. Okay, so a big thing in Florence was uh, the Black Plague, of course. And the Black Plague uh, came just a few years after Giotto died in mid-century and ravaged Italy and all of Europe. And one out of every four people died in the bubonic plague. But when it had lifted, by about 1400 it had lifted. And Florence was actually very, very strong because of the international banking enterprise that was uh, centered in Florence around the Medici family, who were sort of the de, de facto rulers. There was no duke, there was no aristocratic head. They were ruled by council of people that were drawn from the guilds. So they were well-known, uh, 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 wealthy individuals who uh, participated in the guilds and therefore in the business of, um, of Florence. And, uh, and this I found on the internet, this is the, the huge uh, cathedral of Santa Maria della Fiore where someone has removed the dome through the magic of, um, of computers. Uh, and this is the way it actually looked in 1400 because they had completed most of the building and they had completed this beautiful tower that was designed by Giotto. Giotto was not just a painter, he's also an architect of uh, this Campanile. And, uh, but the dome had not been, uh, and they had an altar kind of here and rain came in here. And, okay, so they didn't know how to make a dome because it was such a large space. And the master builder was long dead and everyone had originally worked on it and they just didn't know how they were gonna do it without erecting pillars in the center to help support the roof. And so they got Filippo Brunelleschi, uh, the greatest architect uh, of the century. And uh, I, I, it's no exaggeration to say that Florence is Brunelleschi's town. Uh, a lot of buildings by him, but there are also a lot of buildings that are in his style. The whole city is kind of shaped by Brunelleschi. And there are few of those cities in the world that really encapsulate you know, one person's vision. Another one of these, Barcelona, with uh, uh, Antonio Gaudi's uh, uh, Art Nouveau twisting vine-like things everywhere. It just permeates the whole city. It's his city. Uh, and the same thing for Brunelleschi and uh, the Renaissance. And he did figure out how to span the stone. It stood up now for five, 600 years. And, um, and what he did is he looked, uh, the Dome of the Florence Cathedral, the, the, uh, the, the Santa Maria della Fiore, or the Saint Mary of the Flowers. Florence, or Firenze in Italian, means the city of flowers, the city of flowers. And, um, and this is Saint Mary of the Flowers, the Duomo. And although most of it is in a medieval uh, style, Brunelleschi did both the dome and this, uh, and this uh, uh, cupola at the very top. And if you're adventuresome and you're in Florence and uh, uh, you, you, you may wanna go up, <laughs> Uh, there's a little passageway. There's a dome within a dome, is how we ended up thinking of it. And there's this passageway that winds its way up the dome. And it's very uh, physically challenging. And the last time I did it was a couple of years ago with my students, and I vowed I'll never do it again. Because you can't go back. It's so thin. It's such a claustrophobic space. And there was one girl in the class that she said, I'm not going up there, you know. <laughs> it's just too uh, claustrophobic. There are little windows here and there, and it winds its way up to the uh, cupola. And this um, is a, an aerial shot uh, that was taken by a drone. Uh, and you can see the whole magnificent cathedral with this wonderful uh, top, which is the tallest point in Florence. And, and it sort of crowns the city. Every place you are in the city, you can see this, this, wonderful, uh, this wonderful dome. And you can see the wonderful con Continuity, look at all those orange roofs. I mean, there's really, you know, the whole town is planned as this sort of a Renaissance city, although the city is much older and goes back to it. It was actually a Roman garrison town at one point. And that's one reason that Florence is kind of easy to navigate, the old part of the town, because the Romans built everything on a grid. <coughs> Excuse me, so the, the main part of the old part of town is, is very much uh, in a grid. And the wonderful thing about this and all these wonderful cities in Italy is that there really aren't any modern buildings. You don't see any skyscrapers. There are on the suburbs when you go out of town, the outskirts of town, but the center of the city, nothing is allowed to be taller than the Duomo. And that's been true 
for hundreds of years. And here is the baptistry, this little round baptistry, where they baptize babies or adults or whatever. And then we had looked at the, um, the, uh, the interior of the dome there, the, uh, by Copa di Marco Voldo. Uh, and, and now we're going to go back in and look at it again. As I said, this is Giotto's bell tower. So Giotto was one of those people, like Bruno Leschi, that they could do everything. A Renaissance man could paint, could do some sculpture, could do architecture, you name it, he and his huge workshop could do it. And one of the great, well, okay, so I, enough about Giotto. Let's move into Brunelleschi's theory of linear perspective. Because not only was Filippo Brunelleschi the foremost architect of the first half of the 1400s anywhere in Italy, but he was also the, a theorist and developed the theory of linear perspective. And even the ancient Romans and Greeks did not have linear perspective with the vanishing point and so forth. They eyeballed it and they, were, uh, they did pretty well, but Brunelleschi was able to really uh, uh, grasp it. And the idea of perspective is really very simple. It's that the wall or the panel, in the case of a panel painting, uh, the flat surface uh, is conceived of not as a flat surface on which two-dimensional figures float or deport themselves, but rather the picture plane is seen as if it's a transparent piece of glass. And we look through that glass at the picture. And the picture is therefore kind of an extension of our own world. Uh, and so this is a later drawing. This is not by Brunelleschi. This is actually from the 1600s, but it's the laws were codified. And so this, I think, is an interesting illustration because what we see is kind of how this would appear on a flat uh, a surface. And in fact, if you took a piece of glass, and when I've done this for a church a couple years ago, I demonstrated it where I had a piece of plexiglass. And I just, as long as you hold your eye in the same place, you can you trace everything onto that uh, piece of glass or that piece of transparent, whatever it is, and you'll have a perfect perspective rendering. And uh, Durer, Albrecht Durer, uh, in the early 1500s, who had traveled to Italy and uh, brought the ideas of the of the uh, many ideas of the Italian Renaissance, but most specifically linear perspective. And here, this drawing device, sometimes called the graticulate net, which is a frame that has um, uh, threads uh, in a, you know, crossed uh, to, to create a grid. And then the artist has a piece of paper that's proportioned the same as that graticulate frame with the same sorts of uh, squares in it. And as long as he holds his eye still, and that's where that's that sighting device there, because as, if you move, the perspective shifts. Every time you move, the perspective shifts. If you hold your eye exactly the same, all you really have to do is to trace what you see in each individual little box. And the same thing could be used, of course, uh, not only for translating three-dimensional forms like this female nude, uh, but also two-dimensional forms. So you could take a drawing by the maestro and uh, 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 put a graph over it and uh, triple the size of the graph onto the wall and then trace the individual thing. So this idea of the graticulate net uh, was used a lot. And, 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 and Brunelleschi was the is credited with the invention of it. Um, and, and, and this is a very difficult pose to do because from this angle, from the, what the artist is seeing of the figure, it's very, very foreshortened, for, foreshortened from his, and that's very difficult to draw. But with the aid of the graticulate net, it kind of simplifies it and flattens it out. And so that's the idea, right? Um, and you can see there that, that, that um, sighting device. Well, Brunelleschi, uh, we don't have any drawings or anything by Brunelleschi. We have a lot of his work. Um, and, and actually, the theory of perspective was not written down by Brunelleschi. It was written down by um, um, by Alberti, uh, a little younger than Brunelleschi. But Alberti was a very honorable man in that he said, none of this, none of this is my idea. All of this comes from Brunelleschi, so he gives all the credit. And he actually formulates into a book that's published, uh, Della Pittura, on making pictures. Well, the Florence Baptistry is the oldest uh, building in Florence. Uh, they 
Florentine. Some say it went back to Roman times. I don't know about that, but it's, it's at least before the year 1000. And it's right across the street from the, uh, from the Duomo. If I can get the Duomo back here, you can see the baptistry here, the round or octagonal shaped baptistry. And what Brunelleschi did is he did a demonstration of his theory of linear perspective uh, on the steps of the cathedral. And what he did, and it's described by Giorgio Vasari, uh, an art historian who wrote about uh, 1550. So over 100 years uh, later, uh, these stories had been developed. And this is a, a modern illustrator, but just because he describes it, but we don't have the, the painting. There was a painting that Brunelleschi did in perfect perspective that was done from the steps of the, of the cathedral, looking just straight across at it. And what he did is he painted this panel in tempera very realistically and put a hole in it here as a sighting device. And then you would hold a mirror opposite it so that the mirror reflected the painting. But you were seeing it through the sighting device. You'd seeing it in the mirror. And as you move the mirror, if you move the mirror over here and you move the mirror back, it, it's, you know, is it real or is it Memorex? You know, you can see this amazing thing where every line, every window, every perspective thing is exactly the same as that mirror. And uh, I wish we had the original piece, uh, but, but here uh, uh, an illustrator tries to recreate it for us. And I, I guess you get the idea of it. And here someone actually uh, 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 did it uh, created a, a new piece and he's looking at it there in the mirror in this contraption is over here that you can adjust going in and out uh, of it. And those bell-bottom pants tells us that this was from the 70s. Uh, uh, and, and another thing, what you can see is that there was this reasonable thing that all lines that moved away from the viewer seemed to converge on a horizon at the eye level of the observer, but infinitely far away. And so this is called two-point perspective because in one vanishing point over here, one vanishing point over here. Um, and there it is. Is it real or is it Memorex, right? So that's the actual photo. And you can see, you know, it, it was incredible to people and they lined up around the block to come and see this uh, because of this wonderful device by which Brunelleschi seems almost mechanically to be able to represent the real world with incredible uh, verisimilitude and create the illusion of deep space, but that the picture plane itself was uh, conceived of, at least, as if it were transparent and we were not looking at a flat surface, we're looking through this pane of glass to, to a depicted world. Now, he codified into these ideas that the, the horizon line is always on the, on the eye level of the uh, viewer. And you can test this out for yourself the next time you're at the beach and you see the horizon. Any place you see the, the cornfield in Kansas or any place where you can see the horizon, try doing a deep knee bend and you will see that the whole horizon goes down and comes up with you. So that from your particular perspective, it all goes in this uh, sort of way. And there's mathematical ratios so that you can actually measure the space. So you can create a very uh, strong illusion. And no one really had really figured this out before. Brunelleschi, because he was an architect and especially because he had traveled extensively to Rome to look at the, uh, the architectural remains of ancient Rome, which were pretty well preserved, especially in the Pantheon which because it was turned into a church, a dome building in Rome uh, from ancient times. Uh, but there was also all the, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Roman Forum, all the, the buildings of the Roman Forum, partial as they were, he could gather up ideas from it and create a new sort of classicism that uh, would take as its inspiration that earlier idea. And it was really the Renaissance, and very self-conscious of their place in history that came up with the idea of Renaissance, which means rebirth. And what was being reborn was the humanism of a thousand years earlier. Just before 400 AD, Rome fell. And the way the Renaissance conceived of history, there was the ancient world of the Greeks and Romans, then that fell, then there was a dark ages for a thousand years, and then in 1400, 
it all comes back. And it's a magnificent rebirth of humanism, of, of, of Greek philosophy and aesthetics, and the mathematics that were actually derived from the Arabs uh, in, in Islamic lands like Spain, um, but now uh, utilized to this mathematical, um, um, mathematically precise uh, juxtaposition of space. And so there were these uh, creations of ideal uh, cities, right? And it looks, this is the dream of Brunelleschi, right? This round rotunda building here, the great piazza. And uh, it's very much uh, 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 what was the ideal. And it was called an ideal city. Uh, I'm not sure who did these. I don't, I don't think it is known. Uh, but here you can see another one where there are a couple people deporting themselves around uh, the city. And here is, it looks like uh, the Colosseum in Rome. And this looks like the Arch of Constantine. And this looks like the Florence Baptistry. Uh, uh, and so it's a very precise. And as I said before, we could make a map of this and actually precisely show where each of these people are in relationship to each other. There we can see just a glimpse of the horizon line there. So we realize that we're above this guy. We are above these people. We're standing elevated somehow and looking down at this piazza from a particular viewpoint. Here's another one of these ideal cities. And here you can see that clearly, you know, the vanishing point off in infinity. Now it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting concept as well. Not only is a mathematical way of depicting space convincingly, on a two-dimensional surface, but it was also on a deeper philosophical level, the idea that infinity was out there in the real world. Uh, the the, the, the uh, vanishing point uh, that all these lines converge on uh, is infinitely out there on the horizon, yet it's right in front of our eyes. So infinity is in front of our eyes and it's out there. We look forward out into the real world, into a measurable, scientific uh, depiction of space. So it embodies the idea of Renaissance humanism. Humans, uh, if man is the measure of all things, then we as the individual see the scene from this particular viewpoint of our, of our eye at this eye level. And as we move, the perspective uh, shifts. So it embodies these ideas. There was a wonderful book that came out a couple of years ago, <clears throat> and it's by Samuel Edgerton. It's called The Mirror, the Window, and the Telescope, How Renaissance Linear Perspective Changed the Vision uh, of Europe. Uh, because once you began to see this way, uh, it, it, it was a different way of looking at the world that encouraged a more scientific approach to phenomena. So it embodied philosophical and scientific ideas, mostly scientific ideas, actually. Now, um, another interesting uh, theory that came out up in the early 200s, the uh, 1200s rather, I'm sorry, 2000s, I think about 2002, something like that, a book by David Hockney, a British pop artist, uh, from the 60s, who also writes quite a bit, is very interested in perspective and these different things. And he, um, uh, 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 it's a BBC special, but you can, if you uh, uh, go to YouTube and you put David Hockney's name in, you can find it. I think it's uh, Secrets of the Old Masters or something like that, where he had discovered that by using a convex mirror acts as a lens. And in a darkened room, with a very brightly illuminated scene outside that you could focus an image on, as he's doing here, onto this wall from outside. And it's upside down, right? It's an upside down image, but it moves, it's in full color. And so he, uh, David Hockney, postulated, and it's been very, very controversial among art historians, because he's a painter, he's not an art historian. But uh, boy, and here's, Another, he kind of set up a kind of a little uh, darkened uh, room uh, and illuminated this person outside and, and, and set up a con uh, cave mirror um, and was able to focus this amazing image, which is a mirror image. And he also points out in his book how so many of the figures are left-handed in paintings from the Renaissance and the Baroque period because that would be the mirror image of the right hand uh, kind of a thing. Well, 
what was controversial about it was that uh, uh, mention is not made of this, of this using this uh, mirror in this way. And uh, art historians felt like, well, it's an interesting theory, but uh, why weren't people saying, uh, you know, the artists are very strange, he sets up mirrors and, and so forth. Uh, no one says that. And so there's not a lot of uh, data that supports this other than the purely visual. Uh, but I find it very intriguing. And, and some art historians uh, like John Spike, who wrote a magnificent book, the book on Caravaggio, uh, insists that Hawking's uh, thing is true. And he really feels that Caravaggio, because we don't have no drawings by Caravaggio, that he had traced them in this way. Now we've known for a long time of the camera obscura that was used during the Baroque by Dutch masters like Vermeer, but we had never, uh, this is a new, this idea of the mirror. And this does create this idea of the diabolical, as I said, and I, I know I tried to make the title a, a little uh, provocative there, but you know, when Leonardo was old and he was really had basically given up painting and he was living uh, in the palace of the Pope, of Pope Leo X, who was a Medici Pope, he's the son of uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent, and uh, you know, so he connected by the family to Leonardo, and they said, Leonardo, you know, just live here, give him a sweet apartment, just be a genius, and you know, don't have to do anything. And um, and one of the things that he got in trouble with is that he had hired some, I don't know, German or Flemish uh, uh, mirror makers and lens makers, and had them come and 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 paid for their you know, and was doing something, having them construct some sort of mirrors, which made uh, the church nervous that he was doing something strange with mirrors. And David Hockney does point that, that out. It's the only kind of circumstantial thing we have, but that people felt that uh, maybe there was something kind of sinister. Because remember that Lucifer, luce means light. So Lucifer, the head of the devils in, 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 the, uh, in uh, the tradition, uh, is the bearer of light. And so this whole idea of this secret of darkness and light and reverse images and the sort of mystery of the mirror and the, the amazing way that artists were able to render realistic looking things uh, in a way that had never been seen before. And I think David Hockney uh, uh, makes a good case that that may possibly have been a method that was used. However, the artist who actually did the very first painting that has survived uh, of, based on Brunelleschi's theory was his buddy Masaccio. And Masaccio is one of those nicknames that a lot of Renaissance artists have. I don't even remember what his real name is, uh, but Maso is the uh, nickname for Tommaso, for Thomas, Maso. And Masaccio means Big Tom. So it's like Big Tommy. Uh, and, and that's what he's known as, uh, Masaccio. Uh, and his application of Brunelleschi's theory, he was a friend of Brunelleschi's. They had gone together to Rome. They were friends. Uh, they, you know, how you get a time when two great geniuses exist and our friends are talking to each other, that's, uh, that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, thing. And so Masaccio used the, the theory, not just to do a small panel painting, but to do a major commission. And the commission here was in the church of Santa Maria Novella, which is right across from the, the Dominican church, and it used to be a monastery, and it's right across the street from the train station, which is the only modern building, really, in Florence, and it's ugly. It looks like Mussolini's, you know, nightmare. But uh, it was built during that period, but everything else in Florence, and when you get off the train, it's, Santa Maria Novella is right there. And the very first perspective painting is this, called the Trinity. That's a fresco, it's painted on the wall. And, uh, I wanted to point out, and it's, it's, it's uh, Jesus and God the Father, and then the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove is sort of def, uh, descending from on high. And then next to him is his mother, Mary, and the only disciple that did not abandon him, John. Uh, and they uh, sit in this very Brunelleschian looking uh, archway with, uh, or, you know, with a uh, uh, pilasters that have Corinthian capitals with rondelles, with rounded arches, with the Pietra Serena, this uh, gray um, uh, stone that Brunelleschi uh, uh, did. So this really, uh, you know, uh, in the style of Brunelleschi uh, architecture. Now down below we have Adam, 
we have Adam in his grave. We have the, the, uh, the skeleton of Adam. And um, let me just, uh, and, and so the, the, um, the vanishing point is placed at about five foot eight inches off the ground, which is about the average height of an Italian man. Italian men's a little shorter than Americans. I'm, I'm tall in Italy, uh, but, uh, but not here. Um, and so uh, the uh, horizon line uh, is right there at the eye level. There are also, I should point out, uh, donors, uh, the man and woman who paid for the picture, right, uh, that was on the wall. Um, also, though, uh, if we look at that uh, size of a human being, if you put uh, your arm straight out and inscribe a circle, uh, that same circle, uh, that same uh, arm width circle rules the entire painting and the composition on an abstract level. So that you see the arch uh, it really corresponds to the size of a human. And this is this Renaissance idea of man is the measure of all things. Uh, and now a man is extending this measure to the depiction of space so that he's uh, like a frontiersman going uh, forward and, and doing a painting like this. And people uh, thought this was amazingly realistic at the time. Um, but, but I wanted to point out an interesting uh, facet of the painting. <clears throat> because some people said it looks like there's actually a niche there. The, the illusion was felt so very strong at that time. But if we look at the uh, coffers in the ceiling, see up there, and we count them out, and we uh, measure them, and we try to put together a map of this imaginary chapel, right, that, that the scene is taking place in. The, uh, the cross is up here, and there's, this is the archway, and the archway is indicated by dotted lines because it's, it's not on the floor level. And then uh, the, the donors kneel uh, outside of the, of the niche here and here, and then Jesus is on the cross right here, and, and his mother and John are next to him. However, this shelf that God stands on, that God the Father stands on, is actually nine feet behind the cross. So that when God puts out his arms and his hands are, you see, support the cross, he's sort of lifting it up in this way, it's absolutely impossible because actually, the platform on which he stands is about nine feet behind Jesus. Um, and this is another example of an early Renaissance artist with many more tools than Giotto had to go on. Of course, he has a whole theory of perspective. But even here, he didn't know because, you know, if you actually made, he wants to give the depth, the nine foot depth, so that you would really see this illusion of, of space. Uh, but then, you know, if you put God on the same, if you put God the Father on the same scale as Jesus and of Mary and of John and the donors, back there, he'd be really quite a small figure, nine foot behind. And his, his arms would never be able to do this. But I guess uh, that's one of the amazing things you can do is that you can, God uh, can do anything, I guess. I guess he can bend the laws of perspective and create an illusion uh, that you probably didn't notice this incongruous size discrepancy uh, because God then, if he's nine foot behind, he looms as this giant sort of standing way back in this niche, like Zeus, you know, this incredible uh, uh, thing. So it's, uh, it's an altogether, uh, you know, extraordinary uh, painting. I thought I'd bring in a couple shots there. <clears throat> this is uh, it on the wall. It's a fresco, like with the same technique that Giotto had used, you know, 100 years or early 70 years earlier. Here it is uh, kind of there with candles in front of it. You can see how, uh, how uh, breathtakingly realistic it must have seemed in that uh, church and really the most avant-garde work of art there was. And people came from all over to marvel at how it really looks like a literal niche in the wall. Now, it's not as convincing to us why is that? Women fainted when they saw this and so forth. Uh, it was so breathtakingly real. It's because now we have the photograph, we have moving pictures, we have, um, we have high definition television screens, we have everything. And this, which looked breathtakingly real in 1430, 
uh, now uh, doesn't have quite the same impact. And what we have to do as, uh, as, as uh, viewers, if we want to really incorporate it, is we have to kind of go back and develop the period eye, right, so that we can see this sort of thing. And that's a, that's a, uh, the period eye is an interesting concept and it comes out of uh, Michael Baxendall, one of my all time favorite art historians, a Renaissance uh, guy, painted uh, art and experience in 15th century Italy uh, in the 60s. Uh, and one of the things he uh, associates with perspective there is he said that when merchants were trying to gauge how much these crates that had come in, how much merchandise was in them, they developed a way of looking where you can kind of measure the space. So we felt that that measuring of space was already being done by the merchant class in Italy. And so it was just a matter of Brunelleschi ad adapting and adopting that, that viewpoint and, and, and uh, giving it a mathematical basis that, um, that allowed him to come up with this extremely uh, resilient uh, the theory of linear perspective is used for literally hundreds of years. It's not until the late 19th century in Cezanne that he begins to show things from various different vantage points, where we're not in one place looking at, at, at a picture. Uh, Masaccio's Big Tommy's uh, 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 magnum opus is the Bracacci Chapel, also in Florence. Uh, it's beautiful and, and it, it, ha it details, and it's with his uh, buddy, Masolino, and I like these two guys because Masaccio means big Tom, uh, Masolino means little Tom, and so they were these uh, friends. And Masolino, although he's older than Masaccio, is not as um, as uh, avant-garde. He his work is, is is more reserved and is more medieval. But Masaccio in this Bracacci Chapel, it's really his magnum opus. And this is where he really uh, states what it is that he does as an artist. And so it's his most important uh, work. And Masolino does, I'm showing you the side of the chapel that Masaccio did. Masolino uh, is the other side of it. And, uh, and as you can see architecturally here where it comes. But uh, he it was very young when he did this. And uh, Masaccio is one of the great losses in art history. He died at the age of 28, right? Having been really the first artist to apply uh, Brunelleschi's theory of linear perspective to actual painting. Uh, and, and this in his magnum opus, people really love this. So I'm going to look at a couple of these pictures. I'm going to look at all of them. We're going to look at this, this one here, the tribute money, and then we'll also look at Adam and Eve expelled from paradise. First, the tribute money by Big Tommy. Uh, uh, here, uh, the story is from the New Testament is that Jesus and his disciples who surround him uh, are approached by a tax collector, a Roman tax collector. Remember in Judea was uh, occupied by the Romans. So there were um, centurions and so forth and tax collectors extracting money from the Jews and they resented it, of course. Uh, and this story, the tax collector is shown here holding out his hand, like give me the money, uh, this is how much it costs. Uh, uh, Peter doesn't know what to do here. He's outraged at it and Jesus says, go over and catch a fish over and catch a fish in the Lake of Galilee there. So Peter doesn't know why the rabbi is telling him this strange thing, but he goes over and he, um, and here he is pointing, uh, go over and catch fish. Here's the, here's the, uh, the tax collector. Um, uh, and so he goes. And, and so they also show that scene over here to the right, uh, uh, time-lapse kind of thing we have, uh, Peter, who was a fisherman, right, before he met Jesus, catches a fish, and in the fish's mouth is a gold coin. And the gold coin is exactly the amount that the tax collector was uh, taking, was asking for. And so Jesus uses it as a, and then on the other side of the scene, Peter pays the tax collector. So we see, we see several of the scenes all happening at once. Jesus, the tax collector here, and you can tell because he has the same costume on, it's not twins or anything like that. It's, it's taking place over time. So we ask uh, uh, Jesus, holds out his hand, where the money? The rabbi shows him over here, Peter does it, and then later Peter pays the, uh, the man. 
I want to notice that he does a clever thing in that he, he makes the vanishing point directly behind the Christ, Christ's head so that all the lines converge at Christ. And this is something that Leonardo would use later in his Last Supper at the end of the 1400s. So this is very early in the 1400s. And we can see that's what gives it the sense of space and the sense of depth. <coughs> he also uses a, an idea called aerial perspective. And this they got from the Flemish in the north because Flemish work was coming into Italy as well at this time. The aerial perspective realizes that as things get farther away, they become blue or purple, right? Uh, and that has to do with, uh, we can only sense red, yellow, and so forth for a certain distance. And beyond that distance, we can't perceive red and blue. So that's why if you're driving and you see the mountains in the distance, you're driving in Colorado and you see the mountains in the distance, for example, they look purple, they look blue. When you get up close to them, they're not purple, you know? Uh, they're gray, they're rocks, or they, you know, whatever. But uh, they look that way the farther it gets away. So he's already uh, uh, using two methods to, 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 to suggest the deep space. Both the linear perspective, which as you remember was very, very new. So this was still breathtakingly cutting edge. And people were very interested in what he was doing there. And his use also of aerial perspective that later would be, of course, expanded upon uh, by the Impressionists in the late 19th century. I wanted to compare again to Giotto. This is uh, the mother and father of Mary in legends who met at the gate of Jerusalem. And I don't want to go into that except to show that how Jerusalem with its fortified gates is a doll-like quality. It has a small quality. You can't imagine these figures actually walking up to these towers and being in them because there's this, there's this discrepancy in space because there's no linear perspective that, that rules the painting. But here we see a very different uh, relationship. And we can imagine Peter, after paying off the tax collector, going into the store and walking up the steps and so forth. So that the figures are made in proportion to the buildings that they're around. He uses another dramatic uh, thing that he also gets from Chato, and that is uh, chiaroscuro. Chiaro scuro, chiaro means a clear or light, and scuro, like obscure, means dark. So it's light dark, chiaro scuro. The CH is always pronounced like a K, chiaro scuro. And what he does here is we can see he has one consistent light source in the upper right. The upper right, the light in the upper right shines on Peter's face, and it illuminates the, this part, and the parts that turn away from the light are darkened in chiaro scuro. And here he gives us a very, very strong uh, a personality too to Peter, who's always you know the, the most outspoken of the disciples and so forth. Now I want to uh, switch gears a little bit here and look at the Adam and Eve that he did, which are really I think maybe the highest point in his career as far as uh, the young uh, artist uh, whose the life whose life was cut so tragically short. Some have speculated that he might have been poisoned by an artistic rival. Um, but uh, leaving that aside, here we have the Adam and Eve, and you can see, of course, they had uh, committed the sin of eating the, from the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil, which was forbidden by God, and so now they're turned out of paradise, and they not only uh, can't eat the forbidden fruit, but they also cannot eat the tree of life that, the, that made them always young and always uh, alive, and so now they would have to deal with old age, they'd have to deal with death, they'd have to deal with suffering, all these things because they, they, uh, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, it's supposed to be the source for Christianity of original sin, the tendency, the original sort of inborn tendency toward evil. Uh, that, uh, that, that actually the Jews call the Yetzar Hara, the tendency to evil. In Jews, it's a little more balanced because they have the Yetzar Tov, the tendency toward good and the tendency toward evil. We're kind of drawn to both of them. Uh, but in here, we really see this moment of incredible remorse and regret uh, in this uh, painting. And, and, and he goes far beyond Giotto, even, in, in expressing uh, emotions with the face. Adam is so uh, distraught, he, he, he's so ashamed that he covers his face. Eve uh, lifts her head up and, and just absolutely wails 
in, uh, in regret and remorse and to comprise unsuccessfully kind of to cover up her, uh, her nakedness. Uh, uh, and it's interesting that they are completely naked and we didn't know that until recently because until the 80s, uh, the, 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 uh, the murals had become uh, you know, darkened uh, with time. And part of that has to do with the ritual use. The Catholics use a lot of candles, they use a lot of incense and so forth. And this thing, over a amount of time, it, it, it can build up on, on, on the wall and give it a, a, a gray a quality. And so when they were uh, expertly clean in the 1980s, and now they look like they were painted you know, last week. It's incredible. Fresco is a, is a technique like oil painting could crack, it could yellow and so forth. Fresco psh, colors are true as long as it's kept clean. But what's noticed here is those pesky uh, uh, fig leaves that covered the genitals. Well, they found out that those were painted on later on by some prude who didn't want all those uh, naughty bits to be uh, seen in, uh, in the chapel. And so we didn't realize until we had cleaned them that all that was just painted later. Remember we said fresco was painted directly into fresh plaster so that when the plaster uh, sets up, you can't any longer alter it. If you want to add things, you have to add it, add it al secco. You have to add it as a, a temper painting uh, later and it comes off. And that's really the problem we'd looked at last week with a lot of blue is we, blue is really a difficult color to do in fresco. And what we noticed here is this seam here where there's one giornato, one day, where the artist did just this figure here. And the seam is very, very visible because the blue did not hold. There are also, these were gold originally, but they've oxi oxidized, so they look black to us. Um, but I want to point out also, besides being incredibly expressive, these figures are incredibly beautiful and idealized. This is not just your average guy and woman. These are, you know, like uh, Roman gods and goddesses. And, 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 uh, and Masaccio was definitely looking at works. There was uh, a lot of work that was available in the collection of the Medici family. And uh, he, uh, the Medici were very interested in arts and patrons of the arts, and they made a lot of studio visits and stuff like that. So that, um, so that, uh, uh, and, and this was, uh, I forget what I was saying, but, but uh, uh, <clears throat> works like this also reflect the new idea of the body that originally comes from St. Francis, and that is uh, that the human body is beautiful. It's being created in the image of God. And so what they do is, is what Masaccio does is what actually ancient Greek and Roman a uh, sculptor's dead, and he would have seen this in the collection of the Medici, uh, 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 was, uh, were idealized forms of gods and goddesses from the ancient world. And so he wanted to show human beings not the way they really are, with all their imperfections and things like that, but as they might be in a perfect world uh, uh, of perfection. And so we notice that Adam, uh, although he's uh, very remorseful, is absolutely uh, beautifully proportioned. He's slender, he's muscular, he looks like an athlete. Uh, even his feet, and, and Eve's feet are not dirty. They're walking around uh, barefoot and their feet look like they just came out of the you know, toenail uh, place that they have so many of in New York. Uh, uh, and absolutely uh, uh, like that. And, and, and so uh, uh, Brunelleschi shows us this world this new world that is available through this mirror or through this, this uh, glass through which we look. But we look into the world not like our world with its many imperfections and uh, people have pimples and people are overweight and they have bald spots and all these different, they get old and so forth. And, and no, this is not what they were doing. They were showing the world as it might be in a perfect world. And to get that idea of perfection, it was the ancient Greeks and Romans and, and the leftovers of their culture, but now had become Christianized. And so it wasn't just a rebirth of ideas from the ancient world, because now these ancient ideas of ideal beauty, of Platonic uh, aesthetics, were uh, 
were now mixed with Christian ideas of the incarnation and the human beings being created in the image of God. If only we can uncover that hidden divine spark within humans. And that's what Masaccio was showing us. He's not showing us, you know, two uh, human beings. He's showing them in this ideal state as they might be in a perfect world, or I guess a way of saying it as they might appear in the mind of God rather than in our imperfect world. Um, and he certainly creates a, a level of emotional engagement that people found was a wonderful. They had never seen artwork that was able to ca capture these kinds of emotions, uh, these very human emotions, everybody could ideal, uh, uh, identify with them. And so uh, Masaccio, of course, was a very uh, important artist in, um, in that period. And Michelangelo, uh, as a, an apprentice, uh, went to the Procaccia Chapel and did all sorts of uh, drawings from uh, Masaccio. Masaccio was really um, uh, the uh, uh, exemplar for the young Michelangelo. Well, we've looked at Brunelleschi, who's the theorist and the architect. We've looked at his buddy Masaccio and Masolino, who are the painters that first uh, give form to his uh, ideas of a mathematically perfect uh, universe as it might appear in the eye of God. And here we are in Lorenzo's garden in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in Florence, in the uh, Palazzo Medici, which is now a museum you can go in and, and see. And next week, we're going to look at step, sculpture steps out of its niche. We're going to look at the third major artist of this first generation of the 1400s, of the early Renaissance, the first half is Brunelleschi, architect and theorist, Masaccio and Masolino, the, the, um, the painters, and then finally Donatello, which means the little Donny, it's another nickname, Donatello, who really uh, brings sculpture up to, uh, up to the same high level of perfection uh, that, uh, that the other masters had uh, achieved uh, in painting and sculpture. So that's what we're going to be doing next week. And that's it for today. Now, I'm not sure how I get back onto uh, share screen. Um, you, would, you, you would stop the share and that would bring you back. There, we there go. you okay. are. There In fact, that would work very well because I'm, I'm already thinking like a director that I should have a f uh, speaker screen and identify you and then we go into the share. That might as, work. You know, as you're, as it's okay. They know it's it's a little informal. Yeah. But yeah. Um, now I sh I took everybody off. Let me see. I'm on mute. I guess you have to unmute yourself. But are there any questions? Um, unmute yourself if you have a question. Mary, you look like you have one. I do. Um, I'm just trying to get a period straight. So. Um, Alberti's on painting was be after Piero della Francesco, but before Brunelleschi. Is that when it was written? I, whoops, I whoops, hear. you're muted. Unmute. Muted? Okay. Yeah. There you he's, go. He's the same, about the same generation as Piero della Francesca. Uh, but, but he writes it's della pittura. And it was in Italian, not in Latin. Uh, oh. And that's kind of new, too, because it's really, you know, a handbook for... Uh, for the artist. Yes, you can look up Alberti's Della Pitura. Okay. I'm and who was the guy you told, um, Vaxinal or somebody, uh, uh, the painting of the Renaissance in 1960, maybe? It was oh, some, Michael uh, Baxendall. Baxendall. B-A-X-A-N-D-E-L-L, -L, Michael Baxendall. And Thank I think it's painting an experience in, uh, in Renaissance, in uh, 15th century Italy. Wow. It's from like day 68, but he, and he died a few years ago. He was really the, the main guy. But a lot of it also came, you look up David Hockney and his book on these mirrors and this kind of strange theory that he has. And, uh, and this, uh, the more recent book, and I think it was about 2010, The Mirror, The Window, and The Telescope, how uh, uh, Renaissance perspective changed the way we look at the world. Because we now can see things in a more measured sort of way. So it's really a, um, what do you call it? Uh, it's like the frontier. Uh, there's a frontier of three dimensional depiction of space and they're on the brink of it because now they're armed with this theory, this mathematical theory. And one of the things that, that separated the manual arts like painting from the liberal arts 
like astronomy or music was the having a mathematically based theory, right? So you, there's no way a baker has a mathematically based theory uh, to how to make bread. Uh, but now that perspective was this mathematical, theoretical thing, now uh, uh, art had a new uh, prestige. It was not just a craftsman yeah. making the shoemaker kind of thing, but he was someone who discerns the divine in reality and is able to sort of um, uh, distill from our imperfect world this perfect representation as the world as it, as it should be. Thank you again, it was terrific, really good. Thank you, yes, it. it was great. So now I have to be careful when I, I, I stop recording like I didn't do the last time. Is there any more questions? Anyone have a question? Sure, hi Steve, yes, we can hear you. Hi. Dr. Rafferty? Rafferty, yes. Rafferty, and I'm looking at the word Rafferty, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. At any rate, Dennis uh, is never, his first name. Never ceases Dennis, to yeah. amaze me. It just never ceases to amaze me that so many artists from that era, from, and, and even up to today, are they all, were all born with this natural ability or perspective? Were they taught? Um, was this all from early on in their lives that they had this amazing ability to uh, realize such great uh, perspective on uh, various things? And then once they had this theory, they could really then play with it, you know, because this was a new domain in art, create this world, three-dimensional world. <clears throat> I think we missed the first part of it. What he was wondering if this is a natural thing that comes to people who No, paint. no, that's, that's one of the, um, that's one of the um, myths that artists create. And I used to be an artist before I became an art historian. And as we want to create the illusion that this is the gift from God and you either have it or you don't. <laughs> you know, but the real thing is that something like perspective, anybody can learn it. Anybody. You have to practice it. You know, you have to, you know, you have to be corrected when it's wrong. But eventually, it's just a system. You can learn it. Uh, uh, so uh, <clears throat> there's a kind of mystification that happens with artists. Uh, I think sometimes they want to be thought of as these kind of divine beings. And this is kind of how they were selling themselves in the Renaissance. But if truth be told, it was really stuff that could be figured out and could be taught. Um, and so anybody could learn this stuff. Uh, I know there is a sort of natural um, talent uh, that uh, you know, we think of as available. I think Michelangelo is the kind of best poster boy for that because Michelangelo, one of the greatest sculptors of all time, never studied sculpture. We don't have any record of him. Michelangelo never finished his apprenticeship. He was an apprentice to Ghirlandaio, who did that last supper we looked at, the second one that's in the San Marco. And, um, and uh, 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 Lorenzo, uh, Lorenzo came over and saw Michelangelo, talked to him while they were doing the series of paintings Ghirlandaio was doing for the Santa Maria Novello, the cycle on the life of Mary that's kind of behind the altar in the kind of passageway that goes behind the main altar there in the church and Michelangelo was one of the apprentices mixing paint and working on it. Lorenzo the Magnificent came because he was helping pay for it and he talked to Michelangelo and Michelangelo seemed so intelligent. I don't know if I told, I always don't know if I told this story before to you or not. It's a wonderful Tell story. It. <laughs> the, uh, that, that Lorenzo returns the next day and goes to Michelangelo and said, leave Ghirlandaio, move into the palace with me. You are a genius. You are what we've been looking for. You are, and that's why they call him the divine Michelangelo, because he actually never finished his apprenticeship. So when he started doing the Sistine Chapel, he didn't know how to do fresco. They had a hire journeyman from Florence to come in to teach him how to do it, you see, because he really only apprenticed for a few years. And so with Michelangelo, it really does seem like some natural gift, and, and I can see, because it seems to me like something like clay where you can push and pull and move it around and, and it's very plastic or kind of a medium or a wax or something like that, you could do naturally. But marble, knowing how to chip marble, knowing how not to crack it, the technique and there is so involved that to not study it, to just kind of do it, 
uh, it just seemed like a miracle. So uh, this was this idea of the artist as a genius, as the artist as someone who's touched by God, who's someone who can see the perfection that's in the mind of God and translate it into uh, our human terms. And there was a moral dimension to it as well that's often overlooked, and not just aesthetic, because if we design buildings that are harmonious and balanced and orderly and unified, then the social uh, uh, things that happen in the building will likewise be rational and ordered and, and so forth. So they thought by bringing into being these images of perfection, that slowly we would begin to perfect the world. So that art had a mission, not just to decorate things, but to show us the human potential that God had originally thought of us when he made Adam. Uh, uh, and so it's, it's a very deep thing. And of course, they didn't, uh, they didn't achieve the kingdom of God on earth. Uh, uh, but they tried. And it's in the trying, the magnificent trying, even if they weren't able to fully achieve it, it's just the, the attempt itself is, is just magnificent and something for us to continue to look at for, you know, centuries afterwards. Forever. Forever. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Well, next week, hey. I guess then we'll look at our third in the triumvirate, Donatello, the great sculptor, who also very much influenced Michelangelo, uh, you know, indirectly by, by looking at his work. So okay. I guess... If there's not more things, then we'll call this uh, it, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Okay, and maybe thank you, you like so these, much. Maybe if you like these, we'll do more of them. And we'll continue oh, on. At I love time. having you here. You've been coming for a couple of years, and I'm glad that I, that all of you can come online and do these things. I think we're, we'd be lost without a really good art. And I think recording it is good, too, because now people that maybe didn't work free at 11 can still come and see it later. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. you. I'm going to end the recording.